The feeling of freedom, the feeling of intentionality, that's real. But you are not the ultimate author of that process. Your particles are merely carrying out their quantum mechanical marching orders and you are a vehicle that allows that to happen. Your new book is called Until the End of Time, Mind, Matter and Our Search for Meaning in an Evolving Universe. What, if anything, can physics, which I guess you might define as the, as the rules that govern matter, tell us about the meaning of life? To my mind, what physics can do, it can frame the question. It can give perspective to that question that you cannot get from any other exploration of the world. If you truly understand what reality is, how those ingredients can come together to yield the kinds of entities that we are, that recognition is to me something that can in and of itself provide a launch pad for that very personal search for meaning and purpose. The book deals with the transience of life and, and ultimately of all matter and you and at stages you encourage us to cast our minds forward to the ultimate fate of the universe and I, I was wondering you know what benefit there is in thinking about the end of the universe. Well I think it's very important to face up to the truth of reality which is in fact that life and consciousness is a fleeting phenomenon on the entire cosmological timeline which in some sense makes us feel very small, very insignificant, but at the same time it also emphasizes what we insignificant beings are able to do. The capacity to tell wondrous stories that help us deal with our own mortality, our own impermanence. It's that dual way of looking at things. We are insignificant but endowed with minds that can reach out to the very edge of the cosmos that can give a, a deep sense of purpose and a deep sense of gratitude for the fact that we are even here. I'm also curious about the extent to which you think taking this sort of very grand sweet perspective, um, zooming out to consider everything in its entirety, can somehow inform your day job as a theoretical physicist. The goal of my research for decades now has been to give insight into things like the number of dimensions of space, the way in which the spatial fabric can evolve over time. Einstein thought it could bend and stretch, expand and contract. We all agree with that, but he wouldn't have thought it could rip. That was something that we worked on and showed that with quantum mechanics it can actually tear apart. So putting those ideas of space and time within the grandest sweep of time is something that in my day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day job, I constantly do. These ideas are, are not sort of out there and foreign to the way I go about my daily life. They're kind of integrated in a pretty profound and fundamental way. It must be easy to get very buried in the, the equations of, of a particular, you, you, it becomes very narrow in some senses when it, but it's also a huge broad sweep. So do you think that all theoretical physicists think in this grand sweep way? I think so. I think many got into physics because they were driven by the big mm -hmm. questions, but it's absolutely the case that when you're doing the research, you're down at the nitty gritty level. You're trying to solve the equations, write the computer program to figure something out. And I can't tell you the number of students who come in and want to say work with me, but they have in mind that day upon day, moment upon moment, we'll be talking about the big questions of existence and reality. But look, when you're actually trying to push the frontier of understanding, it is little tiny baby steps generally, and that's the way incrementally you make progress on the big question. I'd like to briefly go back to the start and, and here I'm not talking about the Big Bang, I'm talking about your start in, in physics. Uh, when did you first get interested in these big questions and why? The mathematics was a thing that captivated me. It was seemingly this amazing tool to be able to combine numbers in ways that perhaps had never been combined before, largely because it wasn't interesting to anybody, but it felt like a very creative process early on. And when I then learned later that math could tell you things not just about numbers, but about the real world. You could do a calculation sitting here on a piece of paper that would tell you about how a ball would fly or, or how a planet would move. That was a thrilling moment to me, and that's really what pulled me in to working on theoretical physics. And what is it that keeps you interested now? Well, it is the, the hope that what we're doing today will give us insight into the big questions. I mean, we still don't really know why there is a universe at all. We don't really know how the universe got started. We don't really know 
what space and time are. We don't really know the true nature of the very fundamental particles and laws that govern them. We're approaching and we hope that we're close to having answers to some of these questions, but day to day, the work that we do, we imagine, will take us one step closer to those deep answers, to those deep questions. What drives you to do that, but also to write these books, to, to put this sweep of knowledge from what we've learned in physics in the broader context of human thought? Now, I, I read that your father was a vaudeville entertainer, and first of all, I wonder, is that true? And, and to what extent do you think that that performative aspect, that desire to be able to communicate this plays into to, to your, the way your career has panned out. It is certainly the case that I never felt fully satisfied by just sitting in my office, say with my students, doing the calculations and writing the papers. That was gratifying, but it always felt to me that these ideas are so captivating that they should be more broadly appreciated and the barrier is that we speak and write papers in the language of mathematics. So it drove me to basically translate these ideas into a more accessible language. And yeah, you know, my dad being a, a composer and a singer and a comedian, and yeah, he was on the, the last part of the vaudevillian circuit way back in the, in the 19, mid-1930s, you know. Uh, it did give me, I presume, I never really thought about it in any specific way, a uh, recognition of the power of being in front of an audience and the power to take an audience to a place that you consider to be interesting. When that journey is to the edge of knowledge, it feels to me gratifying. You mentioned moments ago the, the big mysteries there and, and you are, as I understand it, director of the Center for Theoretical Physics at Columbia. So you are herding a, a horde of theoretical physics. I'm not sure what the, the best collective noun is for theorists. Um, but, so you must have your finger on the pulse of, of, of what progress is being made. So what do you think are the big mysteries that we have a chance of solving in your lifetime? There are a number. One of them certainly is the nature of dark energy. So in the late 90s, we learned shockingly that not only is space expanding, it's speeding up in its expansion. And the best explanation we have is that there's an energy suffusing space giving rise to a real pulse of gravity that's pushing everything apart. But what is that energy? And what is it made of? And what are its properties? For instance, if that energy should grow stronger over time, it might in the far future rip even atoms and particles apart. So these are vital issues to figure out. And I think in our lifetime, there's a chance that we'll gain insight into the nature of dark energy, dark matter is another one. Since the 1930s, we've known that there is stuff out there giving off a gravitational pull, but doesn't give off any light. We know that by virtue of looking at the motion of things that do give off light that require other stuff to be tugging on them gravitationally. We've been looking for dark matter for decades, but we haven't found it. Does that mean that we haven't been looking in the right way, or does it mean that there isn't any dark matter and we need better understanding of the force of gravity? Again, I think that's an issue. We may find the dark matter in our lifetime, or we may come up with ideas that are so compelling that the very notion of dark matter evaporates, kind of goes away. Both of those cases, I think it's probably fair to say that um, as our observations get more and more precise, that gives us a more of a chance. But given that you work on uh, string theory, I think primarily, what are the prospects for a, for, a, for a conundrum like that, where it is harder to make observations. So this program of unification is one that drives many of us. It drove Albert Einstein. When we look at the arrows of explanation of earlier theories, they all seem to be pointing toward one central idea that would unify our understanding of nature's forces, unify our understanding of matter, maybe even in one equation that would be the final fundamental mathematical sentence articulating reality. That's the dream, right? And we may have that mathematical sentence. It may be string theory. Any theory, including string theory, that unifies all of nature's forces really only shows its true colors in domains that are very hard to access. Domains of very small size or very high energy. And because of that, string theory is hugely challenging to experimentally test. So we theorists have been 
trying to find clever ways of extracting qualities of the theory that might be accessible to experiments, and we have come up with things. I mean, I've worked on the possibility that string theory would leave an imprint in temperature variations in the so-called microwave background radiation, heat left over from the Big Bang. Looked for those, haven't found them. Could mean that string theory is wrong, but probably means that we just don't have adequate resolution to capture the tiny imprints if the theory is correct. If you ask me in our lifetime, do I think we will test string theory? I am not optimistic about that. Given that you don't expect there to be answers that, to that in your lifetime, how do you cope or how do you personally deal with, with that knowledge that you are in pursuit of an answer that you you, you, by your own admission, think won't come in your lifetime. It's no different from the Odyssey, right? It was the journey that mattered as opposed to the destination. And what fires me up, what fires many physicists up, is the act of exploration, the act of trying to figure things out. And of course, who wouldn't want their work to ultimately be vetted by experiment? That is the, the gold standard. But even without that, the progress that we can make in making the equations come together and the insights that we can glean from those equations, that is really what propels us in a more day-to-day -day sense. And I can even go a touch further. If we could one day prove that string theory is wrong, I'd be thrilled. And I'm not being facetious. I don't care if string theory is right. I care about making progress toward truth. And so that's really what matters to me, not whether this or that theory happens to be the right one. One of the themes that strikes me as, as most crucial and most interesting, and also for, for people like me, most confusing some of the time is entropy. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you're going to go from the grand sweep from the Big Bang to the end of everything, then entropy is a key part of that, right? So it's often described as a measure of disorder and it's spoken in really reverent terms because it's thought to answer some of the biggest questions, the evolution of the universe, why time only runs forward, but it seems very hard to pin down, at least to me. So f can you first briefly explain what entropy is and and, and why it has such explanatory power for, for the way we see the universe. So your description is not a bad one by any means, this notion of entropy as a measure of disorder. We can frame that mathematically, and the way we do that is we look at a system and ask ourselves, how many ways can I rearrange the parts? And it still pretty much looks the same. And if something's very disordered, like for instance, your desktop has got paper all over the place and paper clips. If you rearrange that disordered mess, it still looks like a disordered mess. So there are many rearrangements that pretty much look the same. So the entropy is high. But if your desktop is all, everything's where it's supposed to be, then you start rearranging things. It does look different. There are very few rearrangements of its parts that don't look different. So it has low entropy, which is high amount of order, low amount of disorder. Things tend to go from order toward disorder. Why? There are many ways to be disordered, very few ways to be ordered. How many times have you come home and your disordered desktop just randomly happened to land in an ordered configuration? It's simply the law of probability. So when we're talking about the evolution of the universe, it too will go from a state of order toward disorder because it's so much more likely, so much easier to be disordered than ordered. And that principle plays out across the cosmos in a whole range of physical systems. And yet we have planets, we have stars, we have us, all of which are orderly. So I guess one of the things that people struggle with is if there is this inexorable tendency to disorder, then, then how do we end up thinking about that? Yeah, it is confusing at first sight. How do you get ordered stuff in a world heading toward disorder? And the answer is, this tendency to go to disorder is in an overall aggregate sense. But that doesn't mean there can't be little pockets of order that form along the way, so long as when they form, they give off enough heat and light and energy that that disordered emanation compensates for the order that's formed locally. And stars are the best example. So you've got particles in space. If there are enough of them, the gravity is strong enough that they pull inward and they create this dense collection of particles that gets so hot that nuclear processes ignite, a star is born. In the formation of a star, the heat and light that it gives off 
takes away more disorder than the order that is left behind. And so overall, disorder goes up, even though you're left with a pocket of order in the process. And I call this the entropic two-step. It's kind of like a dance that allows orderly structures to form in a universe headed toward ever greater overall disorder. And the same is true of life, right? Yeah. Well, you should probably explain that, right? That you and I are living beings, but we're just conduits for the universe getting more and more entropy. We eat stuff in the environment, like for me, vegetarian, I eat plants, nuts, fruit. My body burns those ingredients, allowing me to keep my order low. But in the process, I'm always giving off heat and waste to the environment. And if you calculate the amount of entropy disorder that I emanate to the outer world, it overly compensates for the amount of order that is preserved here. So as long as I can dance that entropic two-step, I can stay alive. When I can't dance it any longer, I'm no longer here. So entropy can explain the evolution of the universe, life, and it's also said to be able to explain why time only runs forward. How, how does that work? If there's a process that can occur in one orientation, like an egg cracking on the floor, the laws of physics say that the reverse run film of the egg uncracking is compatible with the laws of physics. But then you ask yourself, why don't we ever see eggs uncracking, right? Why does time always go in one orientation? And it really comes right back to entropy. It's very easy for an ordered system to smash into disorder because there's so many ways to be disordered. It's very hard for the disordered system to come back together and yield an ordered system because there's so few configurations of the particles that will be ordered. So again, in a sense, entropy gives us an understanding of the asymmetry of time. If everything in the universe follows the laws of nature, including the particles and atoms that comprise us, how do we account for our ability to have intentions, make decisions, exert a causal influence on the world? I guess the question in short is, how can physics come to terms with human agency? If your notion of that agency, if your notion of that free will is the version that I think we all intuitively have, that we are the ultimate author of our actions. We are the originator of those decisions and choices and intentions to which you referred. That is incompatible with our understanding of physical law because you and I are both just big collections of particles and those particles are fully governed by the ironclad laws of physics. So every action you take, every decision you make, every thought that you have is nothing but your particles moving from this configuration to that configuration, and that move is fully governed by mathematics. And so the feeling of making a choice, the feeling of freedom, the feeling of intentionality, that's real. The causal influence of what you do is certainly real. You are part of the causal chain of how things evolve from here to there if you are involved in that process. But you are not the ultimate author of that process. That process has been set in motion a long time ago and your particles are merely carrying out their quantum mechanical marching orders and you are a vehicle that allows that to happen. Are we saying that what happens at the quantum level is more real than what happens at the human scale. I wouldn't frame it that way. What I would say is you need all of these layers of reality to tell the fullest story. And so the reductionist account illuminates the human story in an unusual way. And it simply requires us to shift our thinking a little bit. Instead of talking about, I have free will, we should say, I have the sensation of free will. The sensation is real. That's the human story. Instead of saying, I am making a choice, I have the sensation of making a choice. And that's really all that we have access to. We have that feeling. What reductionism and physics does is illuminate that sensation and we recognize that ultimately it's coming from the rock bottom mathematical laws. You recognize that the unfolding is guided by forces that are outside your control. I'm really curious to know what you make of the idea that all matter has some form of consciousness, panpsychism, which seems to be having a moment at the moment. This is the idea that, that even electrons have some rud rudimentary form of consciousness. What's your take on that? Well, I fully appreciate the motivation for an idea like that. It comes from the so-called hard problem of consciousness, which simply is, if the brain is nothing but a collection of particles governed by a physical law, and if those particles themselves don't have any consciousness, 
How in the world could a large collection of them yield the inner world of conscious experience that we all experience? That is a real puzzle. And this has led some to this far out sounding idea that the answer is the particles, you've been thinking about them wrong. They do have conscious quality, a kind of proto-conscious quality. And when you group them together, as you described, you get the aggregate consciousness that we experience. So I fully appreciate the motivation. I'm not convinced at all by the idea. When we understand the brain better, we will recognize that the motion of certain particles processing information in a particular way has a byproduct. And the byproduct is the experience of conscious self-awareness that we all have. And that will be that. You talk in the book about the majesty of religion. Um, what do you mean by that? And what, and what value does religion have, if any, in terms of understanding our place in the universe? If you're trying to understand the objective world of existence that we all have access to, then science is the powerful tool that you should use on that journey, right? If you want to understand the Big Bang or the microwave background radiation or the electron's magnetic moment, don't turn to scripture. It's not going to give you insight into those kinds of questions. Now, the flip side is don't use those qualities of the world to judge religious doctrine. I don't think it was ever meant to truly describe the objective external world. Instead, religion, many of them emerged as a response to our recognition of our own mortality. And that's an inner recognition. That's something which we struggle with, not in an objective way, but in a subjective way. All of our understanding of reality happens in here anyway. And anything that can illuminate the inner world of conscious awareness, that can give you a clearer sense of who you are, where you came from, the ways that you respond to the external world is a valuable part of the exercise of understanding the world. And religion and spirituality, for some, can guide you toward that kind of insight. Given that you have spent however many months considering these, these, this epic journey and these huge themes um, that, make, that make one feel minuscule, what, if anything, keeps you awake at night? Well, the questions that keep me awake at night, if, you, uh, if, I, if I focus on the scientific side of that question, is you know, what actually are we talking about when we talk about time? We understand how to measure time. We understand how to use time as a marker of experience and, and development in the external world. But we still don't really know what it is. So that issue to me is the deepest one that we still face. Is time made of something more fundamental? Are there particles of time, particles of space that only when stitched together in an appropriate manner yield the familiar ideas of space and time that we use in physics and we use in everyday life? Those are the scientific issues that drive me and it really feeds into the larger philosophical issue which you know, to my mind is we live on this little rock around this ordinary star in the suburbs of a galaxy. And to me, I just feel a deep sense of wonder at what we're able to figure out. And the fact that we can ask this question about the nature of time, and we have equations that can begin us on the journey to understand it, to me is just a deeply gratifying part of being a human being that happens to exist in this era that allows life and mind to have a home in the cosmos. Fantastic. Brian Green, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.